Well, welcome out there once again to my program. Always a pleasure to have you out there, and it's always a pleasure for me to be here. I have uh, a guest who uh, I'm going to introduce in a moment, but first of all, I'm going to give you the legal tip of the week. And let's find it here. All right, this uh, concerns security deposits. And uh, one thing you have to remember now, we have a lot of tenants, of course, in Fall River, and we have a lot of landlords. And uh, security deposits uh, are always a problem. It, it, it doesn't seem that um, the, uh, the law is a, uh, adhered to in a, in a correct way. Uh, sometimes uh, when a tenant leaves, they expect uh, that they put down six, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars as a security deposit, that they'll automatically get it back. Well, of course, that's not the case. The landlord will need to inspect the apartment to make sure there's no damage. Now, wear and tear is one thing, uh, but actual damage is something else. And that w that's what the security deposit applies against damage. So if the screens are ripped, uh, the door is broken, you get some cabinet uh, doors that are hanging, that, that's damage. That's not wear and tear. Uh, wear and tear is uh, if there's a carpet uh, or carpets in the apartment and walking back and forth, uh, they get a little worn. Of course, that's wear and tear. Now, when a security deposit is uh, given to the landlord, he's supposed to uh, place that deposit in a bank account. And that bank account uh, needs to generate interest. Now, these days, of course, there's uh, very little interest that uh, is generated. However, the, uh, the account uh, where it is, the bank, uh, and the account uh, number is, is to be given to the um, the tenant, so the tenant knows where that money is. And at the, at the end of the term of the lease uh, or tenancy at will, that money is to, uh, to be returned. And if it's not, uh, well, there could be uh, awards to, uh, to tenants, and, and this, is, this is a tough one, of three times the amount of their security deposit or balance to which the tenant is entitled to, plus interest at the rate. In this case here, it's at 5% from the date when the payment became due. So, well, that's uh, from the date that the payment became due, that's not really bank interest. And if uh, the tenant has to uh, uh, seek uh, uh, an assistance of an attorney, go to court, then uh, court costs are added and reasonable attorney fees so, a word to the wise to uh, landlords, be sure you're handling the security deposits in a proper way, and uh, tenants, uh, be aware of what your rights are if you don't get the security deposit back uh, in uh, short order after you, uh, you leave the apartment. Well, I, uh, I have a city councilor, uh, Rick Cabaceres, uh, he's been on a number of times. He's always a nice, uh, informative guest. Rick, welcome uh, once again. Thank you, it's great nice to be here. Nice to see you. As always. And Rick is uh, a financial advisor. Yes. In your own business. That's right, six years now. Six years. Yeah. Uh, what's the name of the company? Uh, I work out of a firm called Financial Planning Alternatives. I've had my practice there now for three, going on my third year. And actually, the first firm I was with was Aldred Financial, which is uh, local as well. It's great because I have an independent practice. We're able to get pretty much whatever product is out there that's in the best interest of our clients. And you act as a fiduciary and not a broker, is that correct? So I have the ability to act as both. Okay. Uh, that being said, I prefer the fiduciary responsibility uh, because it ties me with the client. So I like to bring in a client and be able to work with their assets for their entire life and work with their families. I try to treat my clients as if they're family members. Okay, and a broker usually works for the, uh, the, the product, uh, the owner of the product that they're selling, like well, a real estate broker. Right, so brokers pr uh, in my industry, pretty much they sell things. They make commissions on sales and they're not necessarily tied to the client for the rest of Which their, not always their time. That's right, so it's important to me to be able to make sure that my clients are 
doing as well as they possibly can throughout their entire lives. Oh, good, good. Well, I'm going to read something, and then we're going to talk about it. Sure. Okay, I think this is very uh, interesting. Sounds good. Especially to public people. All right, let's do it. Like yourself. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start it off, and um, this came out of a recent case that I read. And it says, it's, it says basically, although Hillary Clinton was the focus of the email-related brouhaha, that's the word they're using, last year, similar controversies have been playing out in local governments across the country as other public employees use private email accounts to circumvent, quote, sunshine laws, unquote, that mandate open meetings. This questionable use of email to discuss government business comes as freedom of information advocates stress the continued need for transparency and accountability in government, as well as vigilant application of open records and open meeting laws. As federal appeals court judge Damon Keat famously wrote in 2002, democracies die behind closed doors. Hmm. The need for, de for transparency is thwarted, open records advocates say, when government officials conduct public business on private emails and then claim public records laws don't apply to such communications. However, a recent, in recent months, in Illinois' Attorney General opinion and a federal appeals court opinion from the District of Columbia have declared that government officials cannot evade the requirements and broad purposes of freedom of information law simply by claiming anything on their private email accounts or service is exempt from the reach of public records laws. Sure. So it's actually a very interesting statement, and one of the things that I, I did... Were you uh, aware of that? Uh, I wasn't aware of that exact statement, but I understand exactly why oh. they feel the way they feel. Right. Uh, so this could be a little new to you in regards to emailing? Uh, uh, actually, it's something that I currently practice. So one of the first things that I did when I got elected to government is I got a foreverma.org email address. And the reason why I got that address is so I can conduct, conduct city business on an email server that is completely transparent. All right. So any city business that I do, or any requests for information that I do, or anything along those lines, if it's an email form, it goes through richc at foreverma.org. Okay, and that's uh, available to the public? You can email me at that address if you want to right after this, or anybody who's watching this can no, email no. me at richc at foreverma.org. I take your word for it. Yeah. Do you think um, maybe some of your colleagues are not doing this? I don't want to speak for my colleagues. Uh, I, I know that uh, the open meeting law is something that uh, certain individuals are very, very vigilant on, and um, I, it's up to uh, my colleagues in order to be able to make sure that they're following the law to the letter. Now, um, nine city councilors, uh, how many uh, is required for a quorum? Uh, it's five for quorum. So if five of you meet somewhere, if five of us meet somewhere and we're discussing city business, then it becomes a quorum. And that becomes uh, an official city council meeting? That would be, well, it, it would be considered a quorum, which would make it a city council meeting. It'd be an unofficial meeting, and that's, that's the problem, is we would be having a meeting. Discussing city business. Discussing uh, city, and we would have to be discussing city business. That's the other criteria okay. as well. So that uh, that I found pretty interesting. Right. Um, now let's get into some of the uh, topics of the city that uh, have uh, come up lately. Uh, it's the the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I don't know if I uh, went over uh, with you about this, but uh, as you know, the Chamber of Commerce has changed its name. Right. It's not any longer the Fall River Chamber of Commerce, but it's the Bristol County. Chamber of Commerce. Right. And I'm curious because uh, it, it almost seems to be in opposite of what the Chamber uh, is supposed to be about in the sense that Fall River Chamber of Commerce is, is, is telling people we have a Chamber of Commerce right here in Fall River. Right. But when you say Bristol County Chamber of Commerce, where is that? chamber 
So um, it, there's a couple of things. First, the old Chamber of Commerce was the Greater Fall River Chamber of Commerce. So it encompassed places like Swansea and Somerset and Westport. Okay, so it was, the, so it it was the Greater, it was greater Fall River Chamber of Commerce, oh, okay. yes. Um, then, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, that's not true. It was the Fall River Area Chamber of Commerce. Oh. That's the correct statement, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. That's Later. all right, it's close so, enough. You know what, I'm human, I make mistakes. Yeah. It was the Fall River Area Chamber of Commerce. So, um, so when you consider that, when you think the Fall River Area, at least when I think the Fall River Area, I think of the suburbs that surround the Fall River area as part of that. Uh, part of that. Changing it to Bristol County, and I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. uh, Commerce, as are you. I've been a member of the Chamber of Commerce now for four years. So um, as a member of the Chamber, I don't necessarily see the benefit. Um, and as uh, being in politics, I had a lot of colleagues from other communities call me upset because Bristol County encompasses a lot more than Fall River. It encompasses, it encompasses Greater New Bedford, Greater Attleboro, well, that's it. Greater and Taunton. Th and you're right, and uh, that's part of the, uh, the question because New Bedford has a Chamber of Commerce. Right. And, it, and New Bedford's in Bristol County. Right. And to say Bristol County Chamber of Commerce only o almost signifies there's only one chamber. Right. But that is not correct because New Bedford has a chamber. I guess Tan probably has a chamber. They do. And you know, uh, as, l as long as they're getting the job done at the end of the day, it's a private organization. I, d I really don't have a say in the matter. I can have an opinion in the matter, and everybody has those. Yeah. So everybody's opinion is equal to mine. Uh, that being said, I, I don't necessarily see the logic and why this happened the way that it did. Yeah, it's been brought up uh, by a few people, and I thought I would, uh, I would mention it. Sure. Uh, OK. Now, the other thing is, too, which uh, is uh, the uh, Community Preservation Act. I'm not sure when that uh, is going to be up again f for the voters uh, because when it was initially passed, the people had to vote on it. Mm -hmm. I think maybe its its life is five years, four it's or five, five years. Five yeah. years, so all right. So as far as I understand, it's five years. And we might be coming close to that five-year period. I think we are. I think it passed in uh, 13 or 14. Now, people have been very uh, vocal, people that I know, in regards to... And, and I'd like to stress, I think, because all I'm operating on is the memory of voting for CPA, whether I wanted to pass it or not. And that was in a ballot. I, I honestly don't remember what, what election that was, yeah. but I remember voting whether I wanted CPA or not. So I'm sorry about interrupting you. No, no, you no, that's okay. Um, but a number of people have, have, have mentioned that uh, they they believe that the CPA money, uh, community preservation money, would be used because it comes out of the taxpayers' mm -hmm. real estate taxes. They, res they they have this assessment. A CPA money goes into a special account. Mm -hmm. But people have said uh, that they had the impression that this money would go for public use, public needs, parks, uh, you know, a comfort station down at the park, uh, maybe a water fountain somewhere like uh, across the street from the city hall, mm -hmm. uh, things of that nature where it, it's really public, the public has, uh, it, it's for the public benefit, for okay. the community benefit, for the taxpayers who, who pay for this, uh, or you know, assess for the Community Preservation uh, Act money will get a benefit from it. However, it seems that uh, some of this money is going to private individuals. Sure. And there's something to be said about private entities uh, that have historical properties that are, va are valuable to the his history of our city. Um, for instance, one that comes up to the top of my head instantly is the Lafayette Derby House. I can't even imagine uh, what it would be like without having that place there. They well, are, but that—that's a isn't that a private organization? It's a private organization. They're a nonprofit organization. Okay, it's okay. That that qualifies it a, a step above uh, just private ownership. Fair enough. So, so then we'd go to a place like uh, the Abbey Grill. That'd be private ownership. Private ownership. Um, could you imagine what would happen to our skyline in the event that that church? went down well I, or how how it would impact that community I 
that building is, is I grew up in the neighborhood. I, I would not want to see that building go down. So I, I'm of the opinion if it's being used to preserve and, okay. and people. Let's say we go along with that. Sure. And uh, the Abbey Grill is, you know, is, a, is a really very nice building. Um, you know, a lot of nice buildings in the city of Fall River, many, mm -hmm. many. And uh, the Abbey Grill, I don't know how much they got, 100000 120000 I don't know. Uh, to a lot of people, that's a lot of money. Right. Well, it's a lot of money. Let's be realistic. Pri uh, public money, access, uh, uh, taxpayers' money has gone to a private individual because they own a historic building. That's fine. They fix the building up. However, it would be nice if two, three years from now, the owner of that building decided to sell, and they got 100000 for easy figures from the city of Fall River mm -hmm. to do some rehabilitation uh, of that building. I would think that people would be more happy uh, or satisfied that that $100,000 at, at a low interest rate, we'll say maybe 2%, which is $2,000, would be returned to the city. Well, here's something else to consider too. That $100,000 invested into a private entity, especially a business, is going to increase the value of that property, oh, yeah. meaning that we're going to generate more tax revenue, and businesses pay double the amount of revenue than uh, a taxes than than residences do so I'd like to think that we get our money back eventually anyway I think that's probably one of the best ways to invest CPA because when you talk about giving it to something like a nonprofit organization or putting it into a park do we see a return on investment we get it we get a visual return on investment then we have to worry about maintaining that so that requires taxpayer dollars if you use the logic of residents and getting money back or residents getting a return on their investment then I would see this as being the best way to get a return on investment. Well, some people might say, you know, it's it's a private business. He, right. he is a private. He's, he's sure. He, they're making money. Sure. They serve food. They're going to have rentals. I imagine uh, that that's more money to the private owner. Sure. Not, well, the private owner is going to make more money too, but we have the ability to earn more money on that as well. All right. So. <laughs> so if you think about it. Not Well. Uh, I don't see a reason why anybody who has a historical property that they're trying to preserve should not be entitled to these as well as public money or a, a non-for-profit non organization. All right. We'll let that go because I know people have very uh, difficult sure. time understanding how private, a private person can get public money, even though it's a historic building. Right that if they bought the building, they bought it with open eyes, and if they can't afford to fix it up and take care of it, then they should sell it to someone else who has the money. Doesn't mean it'll be torn down, but it could be in the hands of someone who has more money or uh, a, a, a different uh, idea of what to do with the building. So well, Here's something else to consider, too. So it's not just those tax dollars that go to people who purchase historical buildings and renovate them. You have the ability to get state and federal tax credits that's taxpayer dollars as well. Oh yeah, well see that, the, the thing is, is what, what the, the problem with people who think about these things is that there's too much government involvement. Sure. Let, if, if, if private owners want to uh, do something with a building or buy a building, let them do it. Keep the government out of it because the government is, is, is getting too much involved in, in business. It's it's uh, it's appropriating money through taxes uh, from people who work and sometimes can barely get by and can't you know uh, have two family houses or three family mm -hmm. houses in the city of Fall River right. and because of uh, rental problems they they just managing yet they see that someone who has you know a fancy building who who must have money to buy it to begin with then gets a hundred thousand dollars from the city of Fall River. Or one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, anyway, well, and to add to that, just just a tad, um, I, I understand that argument. I understand that they feel that the government is potentially too involved in it. Uh, but if we didn't have government subsidies, let's call them, for buildings that are large like that, how much more difficult would it be to get somebody to potentially renovate it? So we were talking about the police station last night, actually during the city council meeting. 
And after all the subsidies of federal tax credits, state tax credits, and all the other incentives that they could get, you were still talking about three, two million to three million dollars that you'd have to go out for a loan. And the unfortunate part is the city had only done the analysis on housing, uh, whether it be market rate or low income. And I had made the statement that maybe we should consider getting a business here. We can make double the amounts of revenue and they can turn a profit with something along these lines. Well, the city, the city made a big mistake under the Lambert administration, maybe 14 years ago, when they had a buyer, uh, Tony Cadero. He offered $25,000, I believe, and someone offered uh, maybe 40000 mm -hmm. And he chose the person that o offered this little extra money, and it became a disaster. The person did nothing. Matter of fact, he was he was scamming, uh, you know, with his real estate dealings, and that that th this is this is uh, well, this has nothing to do with CPA money, but sure. here's a building that the city has really failed, right? Because since 14, I would say 14 years ago, they haven't collected a nickel in taxes, right? So right. That, we're that seeing the same thing with Kilburn Mill uh, and King Philip. I'm sorry, you both King Philip Kilburn Mill is on Kilburn Street. Yeah. So King Philip Mill, Kilburn Mill, it's got probably three other names that I don't no, even no, no, know King, about. King Philip Mill. <laughs> so, um, so the, uh, the point that I actually I was trying to make at the meeting uh, in previous meetings was, you know, I'm the chair of real estate, send it to the real estate committee. The first reaction to that was, no, we, it's tax title, we won't, don't want you to have it. Now it seems like uh, the administration well, is Well, why wouldn't they want you to have it, even though it's tax title? Because it was tax title. Well, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's not under our purview, was the argument that was made. It sounded to me like they wanted a specific type of thing in there, and I'm of the opinion that if we have municipal property, I just proved it with three other buildings. If we have municipal property on the books, and we want to turn them into tax producing properties, we put them out to the open market and we see who purchases yeah, them. Yeah, uh, the mill has been languishing now for at least, I would say, five years. Right. Once again, the city hasn't got a nickel because the city owns it. Not only that, uh, apparently there's five to six hundred thousand dollars in back taxes that need to be uh, right. taken care of because so I think the Department of Revenue. You can be creative with that too. So tax increment financing is a valuable tool for a business who wants to come in. So you could do something along the lines of, hey, pay us seven hundred thousand dollars up front. We'll give you tax increment Can't financing. Can't find anybody. Well, it, part of it is, what are we doing in order to be able to find people? So they, they hired this real estate consultant for twenty-four thousand dollars. Yeah, I was going to get into that. And there's no, there was no marketing effort whatsoever. That was proven last night by Councillor uh, Punt and Councillor uh, Councillor LeBeau. Yeah, twenty-four thousand dollars in regards to marketing the police station and the King Philip Mill, and nothing has happened. Is that correct? That's right. The guy got twenty-four thousand dollars. There's no proven. Who marketing? paid him? How did he get the twenty-four thousand? That Who? came out of the mayor's budget. Mayor. I'm sorry, no, uh, uh, that's not correct. It came out of the assessor's budget approved by the mayor. Twenty-four thousand. Yep. So that's it. That's, and, and that's twenty-four thousand gone. Right. And, and they. Uh, Councilor Pont who, who pointed out last night that the person who got the the uh, the bid wasn't even licensed to be a real estate agent. wasn't even a licensed agent in Massachusetts. wasn't a licensed agent. So, my concerns are now they're talking about taking thirty thousand dollars. Was there a bid uh, put in? Yes. So he, this person who got the twenty four twenty four thousand actually won a, a an open bid process. That's right. So um, the the interesting part about this is now we're the mayor is requesting to uh, the, for the council to use more money to for these ideas that are way outside of the box that have no substantial evidence to support them and I'm concerned that you uh, could go up or I could go up tomorrow and say hey you know what? I'm gonna throw my name in the hat for a bid and make a thirty thousand dollar paycheck and not be able to deliver on it well yeah and so who, who was who uh, what, what group uh, vetted uh, the uh, the people who bid was it just a matter of uh, who the low bidder was? Well, there was only one bidder. Just him. Right, but you still have to go through the process of figuring out whether it's a good bid or not not a good bid. It's uh, what is it? Uh, very highly favorable to unfavorable, and so the bid could have been refused. Right. So the, the when we were tr when we were talking about the Coughlin School, um, 
I found both projects to be unfavorable to the point where I was willing to vote no and let's put Coughlin School back up on the map again. And uh, the council, through their better judgment, decided to disagree with that. We gave the school to somebody else. But you have the ability, even though you get bids, to say no. Well, let me ask you one more question. Sure. If you know the answer, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Harriet T. Healy School on Hicks Street, is that city owned any longer or private? I don't know. Uh, actually, we have a resolution in, uh, in real estate right now to talk about all the city property that we own as a city, not just buildings. You're on the real estate committee. I'm the chair of the real estate committee. Okay. Uh, you have a list of all the city property that's uh, 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 own city property that, that needs to be disposed of? We're asking them to generate that list right now, and that includes land. All right. Uh, how many on a committee? Uh, there's three. It used to be five. We filed, uh, 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 we amended the ordinance to be three. Uh, and so I, I think it's fine with three. You have yourself? It's me, it's Linda Pereira, and it is Steve Long. And Steve? Oh, Steve Long. Long. Yeah, okay. All right. Anything you want to add? Uh, Lou? No. <laughs> uh, anything you want to add? <laughs> well, no. Okay. Uh, you're running this year for city council? Uh, I, it's an election cycle, and I haven't made my decision yet on what I'm <laughs> going to be doing at this point in time. Uh, I'm getting really good at that answer, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the yellow ones, I don't want to speak for my colleagues. That, that's a good one, too. Well, I, I would, uh, uh, I'd just say keep your eyes peeled. I'm sure there's going to be lots of excitement coming out in the near future. Do you know of any uh, uh, potential candidates, uh, new ones? I've heard a lot of names. Give me uh, a name or two. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to drop people's names out of place. If you, you read the newspaper, <laughs> I'm not the person who likes to spread gossip. I, I just say keep your eyes peeled. I'm sure it's going to be an exciting one. You think uh, there's going to be a mayor's race? I think there could be. I think there's going to be a, a, there could be a, a substantial city council race as well. And I think there could be a substantial school committee race as well. I'm hearing a, a, there's a lot of rumors out there. I'd say keep your eyes peeled. Well, let's use the same newspaper let's, and let's watch the Let's use the, the show. same word. You think there'll be a substantial mayor's race? Yes. Okay, that, that uh, we like to change mayors, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it, it's, it, it's it, had almost two years, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we really do need some stability in that seat. The question is, is are we going to just settle for suit? Uh, are we going to settle for stability just because of the fact it's who we have, or are we going to pick the right person and then allow that to be stable? Um, I think what we need is we need a vision and we need somebody who's planning for future, making their decisions based on future impact as opposed to immediate impact. What does the city need? What's, what's, okay, well, all right, that's the end. Real quick. You're off the hook. We need to get more middle class jobs. Okay, how are we going to do that? Economic development, new economic development policy. Well, we have a uh, Fall River Office of Economic Development. Well, I think that some of their practices may be stale. I think we might want to revisit some of them. Okay, thank you for uh, stopping by. Sure and, thing. Uh, we'd like to see you uh, soon in the future. Once this uh, city council race gets heated up, let me know and uh, have you come back on. Give us some, uh, we need some inside inf insight <laughs> information. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, by that time, there'll probably be a lot of uh, a lot of things to talk about as to who's running or not and right. why and etc. All right, that's it.